folks, welcome back for another Feature Friday. I'm your host, Ryan Glover, and this week we're going to be learning how to build a drag and drop sortable list. Now, this is one of those features that's very, very common in products on the web today, uh, but what's kind of difficult about this feature is not so much the UI and getting the drag and drop to work as the storing of the data powering that list. And what I mean by that is the ordering of that list. So when we're dealing with drag and drop, we have to remember that position is key. And so what we're going to learn in this tutorial is not just how to design the UI and implement it, but we're also going to look at the database side of things. And we're going to learn how do we actually store that ordering and keep it in sync so that no matter what, when our users load up one of their lists, it shows up in the correct order. So if you're ready, let's get started. To get started, what I want to do is take a look at what exactly it is that we're going to be building. And just like we've been doing the past few weeks, what I want to do is look at an example from Command. And if you haven't been watching these or this is the first one that you've come across, Command is the first SaaS product that's going to be coming from Clever Beagle in a few months here. And Command is a product that I'm designing to help you manage and promote your own product. So what we're looking at inside of command is this requirements list and you can see we've got a yeah dude here so i'm going to go ahead and clear that out and the idea behind requirements is very simple it's just a simple to-do list in relation to what i'm calling cards inside of command so there's five different types of cards there's is that right five yeah it's five idea feature bugs refactors and chores so this is very much a developer or product themed type of product uh, so what we're going to do on this feature card is add some test requirements and I'm just, I'm just going to make this up as we go. So we'll just say um, this and this, another one, and okay, I'm, I'm just going to stop that. Um, so what we're trying to build in this tutorial is this part. So you'll notice as I start to click and hold items in the list, they start to sort. Now what we want to pay attention to, so let's, let's try and memorize the order here. So we've got another one, this, and this. Um, it's kind of hard to do, so let's, let's actually no, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna beast mode this one. We're going <laughs> to try and memorize this. So another one, this, and this. Um, another one, this, and this. Um, it's kind of a song. Another one, this, and this. Um, another one, this, and this. Um, another one, this, and this. Um, Nice. So what we'll notice is that I was able to click between another card inside of command and load up a totally different set of requirements, totally different data, but then come back to this first card that we're looking at, so sortable drag and drop list, and notice that the requirements list stays in the correct order. So if I do this again, I'll do it real quick. So I'll say um is at the top, and we come back. Now um is still in the same order. Now, this isn't that impressive and this isn't really that crazy of a thing because if you're familiar with tools like React, which is what we're going to use to build this, you may be thinking like, well, duh, you can just keep it on state. And that's true. But what's neat, and let's go ahead and give this entire page a refresh. So I'm going to move um to the middle of the list. If we give this entire page a refresh, not only are we utilizing React state, but notice here, we're also persisting those changes to the database. And so that's what we're going to learn how to do right now. So before we dig into the code, what I want to do is show you the package that I'm depending on in order to do the drag and drop sorting of the requirements listing command. So this is the react-sortable.js package on NPM. And the reason that I really like this package is that it's based on another package or another library called sortable.js and sortable.js is a package that's been around for a pretty long time uh, at least four or five years now uh, it's just a generic javascript library for doing drag and drop sorting and so what's nice about this is that it's giving us all of that functionality and then the react sortable.js package is giving us a react component to take advantage of sortable.js inside of our react ui so jumping over to the code for this, what I want to do is show you first how we're pulling sortable JS in here. So what we're doing is pulling in the sortable component from the React sortable JS library. And if we jump down to the render method here, and this is the requirements component inside of command. So real quick, if we jump back to our UI here, this is this list here. So when I'm doing all of that and 
checking things on and off and this progress bar, all of that's the requirements component inside of command. And so at the top of that file, we're importing sortable from React Sortable JS. And then down in the render method, we can see how we're putting it to use. So what I've got here is the sortable component inside of the requirements list component. So requirements list here, this is a styled component, doesn't look like it, but what it's doing behind the scenes is it's returning an unordered list component or unordered list element, HTML element uh, from this component. And so what we're doing is inside of that unordered list, I'm rendering the sortable component and then inside of that, and this is where this gets uh, interesting, is I've got the dot map function for my requirements list. So quite literally, we have our UL, but then we've got the sortable component inside of that. And so what that's doing is it's saying all of the elements that we're rendering inside of that sortable component are going to be given that drag and drop sorting functionality. And so if we jump back to the browser real quick, whenever I do this, so when I'm moving this, and we can see we've got this kind of like semi-opaque element that I can drag and move up and down. Quite literally, by virtue of adding that sortable component to the UI and nothing else, that functionality is added, which is awesome. So this package is really good for just getting that basic functionality without you having to really lift a finger. It's, it's pretty simple. So it's not fully functional yet, but it does give us that nice effect of dragging and dropping elements, which is pretty cool. Like, I'm not fiddling with state or anything like that. It's just automatically doing that for me, which is pretty cool. So. In order to actually make this useful, what we need to do is dig into the on change handler in Sortable. And before we do that, I do want to point out one thing, which is this data-id attribute. So what this is doing is it's allowing Sortable.js to detect which element is moving, and more importantly, and we'll see this in a few minutes here, the order that that element is sitting in the entire list. So if we go back to this list, each of these elements has an ID, and the ID that we're giving it is the uniquely generated ID from the database. So we'll get into the whole database side of this in a little bit, but know that each of these elements has a unique ID assigned to it, and what we're doing is we're relaying that over to React Sortable, or actually Sortable JS is the one that really cares about this, uh, via the data-ID attribute. Now, data-ID, that's just a data attribute, so that's not um, some React convention or anything like that. So we could, you know, for all intents and purposes, do data-pizza equals underscore ID. It's going to work in the exact same way um, in terms of data attributes. So data-ID is the one that React Sortable is looking for. It's not looking for data-pizza. That's me. I'm looking for data-pizza. So with that data-ID on there, the next step is to add this on change handler. So we've got this dot handle order requirements. And if we go and look at that function on the component, what we're going to see is that we're doing a few things in here. But before we dig into the actual mechanics of what's going on, what I want to show you is the order argument that's being passed to this function here. So you'll see that I'm logging this out. So what we're going to do is save this file. And the idea here is that whenever we change the order, whenever we sort our list, what we're going to get back is an array of the IDs. So remember, we have the data-ID attribute back down here on each of our requirements. So whenever we sort the list, what's going to happen is sortable.js is going to look for that ID, and then it's going to give us back an array of those IDs in the order that those items were dragged into position of. So if we go back to our browser here, Let's just go ahead and give this a refresh, make sure we're up to date. So I'm going to say set a sortable drag and drop list, and I'm just going to move this. And so when I did that, we should have gotten a fire of the on change handler of that component. We can see some arrays down here, but what I'm going to do is clear that out, and I'm going to drag this to the top. And you'll notice that we get an array of IDs back, and those IDs, again, are matching the IDs of the items in this list, and they're in order. So if we pay attention, we've got WLX TWL as this first item. So if I move this down to the bottom, so we're looking at WLX. If we look here now, WLX TWL has been moved to the bottom of the list. And same exact thing, if I move it to the middle, we'll notice that it starts to appear in the middle of the list. 
And so what's happening here is that React Sortable is communicating back to us, hey, here's the current state or the current order of items in this list. Now, in order to make sense of this back at our code, again, we have our handle order requirements function that's being called by the on change callback on our sortable component. So literally, when we sort our list, this is the function that's being called. And again, it's being passed the order of the items in the list by their ID. So that's literally all we get. We get an array of IDs, but those IDs are in the order that they appear in the UI. So what we need to do now is actually make use of that list. And so the way that I've designed this specific component inside of command is we're utilizing state in order to actually display our requirements. And so to kind of unwind that a little bit, what I've got here is the view card modal component inside of command. So this is literally this entire component here with all of this stuff. That's the view card modal. And so inside of there, I'm rendering the requirements for this specific card. So if we dig into here, I know it's floating around, you know, there it is. So we've got the requirements component being loaded and you'll notice I'm passing requirements. So literally the list of items from the database as a prop down to requirements. And so internally inside of the component, in order to set this up, what I'm doing is I'm passing props.requirements as the default value for requirements on state. So literally this.state.requirements inside of the requirements component is being defaulted to or being set to whatever those requirements are from the database if they exist. And so the reason I'm doing that is to make this whole sorting process a little bit easier, but also a little more performant. And so what I mean by that is we have to keep in mind if we're going to persist this data in a database ultimately, there's going to be some sort of delay between us making the change and that change hitting the database and then that change in the database making it back to the client. And so as you can imagine, and you've probably run into this before if you've tried to do this, what's gonna happen is we're gonna get a really jittery UI. So if what I did was directly rely on the database value in the UI, if I make a change to that database value, or in this case, if I resort the elements, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna to have to wait after I've made that change for it to go to the database and then get back down to the UI. So literally there's gonna be like a uh, and then it's not gonna work. And so what I'm doing here is I'm relying on React State to give the user that instant feedback visually to say like, oh, okay, hey, you've sorted the list. So literally we'll notice I just did that and it looks instantaneous to me as a user. Like there's nothing that's jarring about that. And what's nice about that is I get that instant feedback as a user and then I can do a write to my database. So we're going to look at the write to the database next, but that's, I wanted to make sure that's super clear. So that's why I'm using state. Now, in terms of the how, what's going on here is I'm saying when we order the requirements, we make a call to set state. Notice here I'm using the callback version of set state. And so what that's doing is it's saying, set state via a function that returns a new state object for me. So we can see here I'm returning an object from this function. So this function is returning a new object of requirements for me. And that new object of requirements, so requirements here is matching this dot state requirements up here. So what I'm doing is I'm getting a function which is past the current value of requirements on state. So literally, the current this.state.requirements value. And then inside of that function, I can reuse that current value to do something. And so internally, what I'm saying is give me the order that we're changing to. So this is the new order of IDs. And so you'll notice what I'm doing is I'm saying run a map over that order. And again, this is a map over the array of IDs that we're getting from React Sortable. So that's all we're doing right now. We're just saying map over or loop over that list of IDs. You'll notice what I've got in my map function is a requirement ID. And again, that's one of those IDs in the array and the index of that item in the array. So those two things are super important. We've got the, the ID in the array that we're currently mapping over. 
and the index. And so to make sure that's super clear, because this is important, requirement ID here is one of these. So we're mapping over this entire array, and what we're getting is, so we're getting A8Y, then N90, so we're just going in order of whatever the order is that we're getting back from React Sortable. And so what I'm doing inside of the map is saying, okay, in order to update the order, I need to know which element or which requirement I'm updating the order of. And this is the tricky part. So what I'm saying is first, let's go ahead and find which requirement we're trying to make a change to. And so I'm saying with a variable here called match requirement, and this is, this is arbitrary, that's just what I decided to call it. So this is the requirement that we're currently trying to set the order for on state. So I'm saying get the matched requirement and the way that I'm doing this is I'm using a JavaScript find function. So the find function is a find inside of an array. So a JavaScript array. So find is on the JavaScript prototype for arrays. And so what I'm saying is in the existing requirements array on state. So this is this dot state dot requirements. That's essentially what we're doing there. The reason we're not is because this pattern of using set state is giving us requirements directly as it currently exists on state. So I'm saying in that existing requirements array, I want you to find the object where its underscore ID value is equal to the requirement ID that we're currently mapping over right here. So again, the ID that we're mapping over is one of these. So I'm saying find that item as it exists on state. So it currently exists in this.state requirements. Let's find it. And so what we're doing once we've got it is we're taking it and we're spreading its contents. So this is uh, like if you've ever gone to a hotel and you, you have a suitcase, this is you unpacking your suitcase into the dresser drawers at the hotel. This is us unpacking the contents of that existing requirement onto this new object. And the reason we're doing that is we need to take whatever that existing requirement is. And by existing requirement, what we mean is the ID of the requirement, the actual text of the requirement, so what we're doing. In this case, another one is the text of the requirement, or and, or this. Those are the text of the requirement. And we're also taking in the completed status. And completed status is when we check one of these off, that's what's telling us to change the look of the UI here and add to the, to the progress bar here. So those two are completed, now just this one's completed. So we're tracking those three elements, but we're also tracking the order. And so you'll notice what I'm doing here in the map is I'm saying, as we map over, tell me the requirement ID, then find that existing requirement and then what I'm doing is I'm using the index value from the map. And remember, indexes, when we're talking about maps, are zero-based. So this is the order is 0, 1, 2, 3, not 1, 2, 3, 4. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking that index value, and I'm setting that as the order. Now, it may seem a bit confusing. So what's cool about this is that I can get away with that because I know that the order that I'm getting here which again is that array of IDs, I know that that's in the correct order. And so by virtue of that, when I map over that, assuming it's in the correct order, I can also assume that the index, or rather the position of each ID in that array, is going to match the actual order on screen. And so if we kind of match that back to our UI, because this is pretty confusing. Uh, so if we go back over here, uh, did I get rid of our... No, I kept it. Okay, so let's go ahead and uncheck that one. I'm going to do another sort. I'm going to move another one back to the top. Yeah, so we'll do that, and then we'll do that. Okay, so the array we're paying attention to is this bottom one. And so what we'll notice is another one has A8Y4WX. And so that's our ID. And so I know that this is the first item in the array. And again, we're dealing with a zero-based index with an array in JavaScript. So this is position zero. I know that this, this uh, item here, or 5SAT, that's position two or one in an array. So again, we have zero, one, two, three, four. So even though we have five elements, we start with zero. And so back in our code, 
I know that that index is going to actually correctly reflect the order of this element. So, whew, that's the long-winded way of saying we're setting the order of the elements that we get back from React Sortable back onto state in the form of our requirements. So even though it doesn't look like it, what's happening here is we're taking that order and because we're using a map, remember that a map in JavaScript is returning a new array. So we already know that order.map is going to get an array and we know that this.state requirements is expecting an array. And the reason we know that is if we go back down to our render function, we can see that when we go to output the items or our requirements in our list, we're doing so using that this.state.requirements value. So that's what we're mapping over to output stuff onto the screen. And so back up here, we're saying, okay, go ahead and map over all those items. And for each item that you map over, return an object or return a new requirement with the existing contents of that requirement along with the new order, or in this case, the index position of that item in the new order array, and then put all of that back on the state. That's a lot. Um, this is something you really gotta practice with to wrap your head around. This code is written as somebody who's done this a, too many times to, to wanna say. Um, so I've, I've gotten this a little more efficient than you might when you first make an attempt at doing something like this. Um, but trust that what's going on here is we're just saying update the value on state with the new order. That's what we're doing. So if that was confusing, definitely take some time to rewind this and go back and listen to that explanation a few times. Because uh, it sounds like total BS right now, but if you really step through it and do it yourself a few times, you're going to see that, oh... Okay, he's, he's not kidding. It's, it's just that's what it looks like and that's how it works. So, all that said and all that out of the way, now what we can do is start to worry about the database side of this. So you may be thinking that when I say database side of this, that's the scary part of this. But in all honesty, the part we just stepped through was the scary part of this tutorial. So you can kind of you can breathe a little bit. Uh, it's not going to be that terrible. Um, and I kind of hinted at this earlier. So you can see here that we're doing our set state call, but then I've got a callback function as part of set state. So if I kind of de prettify, prettier, pretty, prettier, prettier, fi, pretty, oof, that's rough, prettier, fi. <laughs> if I de prettier, fi this, you can see that what I'm doing is I'm passing a callback to set state after our actual set state function. And so, just to make sure that this is clear, what I'm going to do is kind of trivialize this first part so that this is clear. So let's back this up a little bit. So what I'm doing, you may not have seen this before, so if we were just to set requirements directly to order like that, ignoring all the other content, this is probably going to look a little closer to what you've seen in terms of using set state. And you may have also seen before that you can pass a callback function to this.setState. And that callback function is literally saying, after we can guarantee that the new value we're trying to set on state has actually been set on state by React, go and do this other thing. And so let's go ahead and jump back to our actual code. So what I'm saying is go ahead and set the new requirements order onto state and then do this. And so the and then do this part of it is I'm saying if this.props.onEdit is defined, and the reason I'm doing that if check is that this requirements component is used in two places in command. So it's used when you're creating a brand new card inside of command and it's also used when you're editing or viewing an existing card inside of command. So I gotta do a check here. I gotta make sure, okay, if that function actually exists, then try and call it. And so what we're saying is update our requirements and then once that edit completes or on that edit event, call to this.props on edit. And so because we're saying props, if we go back to where this requirements component is being loaded and where I know that the on edit is being done, which is in the view card modal component. And again, view card modal is this entire component. So this manages the entirety of that card in the database. 
So back in that component, view card modal, we've got our requirements component rendered, but you'll notice we also have that on edit prop being passed. And so that on edit prop is calling to handle edit requirements. And if we jump up to that function, what that's doing is pretty much what you'd expect. It's calling to our database. Now, remember that for command, what I'm doing is I'm using pup. Uh, so pup is the free boilerplate offer, boilerplate, boilerplate offered by Clever Beagle uh, that you have full access to. So this is available at cleverbeagle.com slash pup. And pup is a boilerplate application. Uh, it's based on Meteor, but it's using all modern JavaScript, Node.js, NPM packages, React, and all that good fun. Um, and it's also using GraphQL for its data system. So when I say save this to the database, what I'm saying is run a mutation in GraphQL. Now, we're not going to dig into the, the fancy explanation of what GraphQL is and how all of that works. All I want to show you here is that, okay, we're communicating that change back to the database. And so what we're going to do is learn some React tricks here. So um, if we go back to requirements real quick, you'll notice that when I call this.props on edit, I'm not passing anything to it. I could, but I'm not. And so the reason I'm doing it mostly is nerdum. Um, it's, it's not really <laughs> necessary, but it's kind of fun to do. So one of the things or features in React is the concept of refs. So keep in mind, okay, we're calling handle edit requirements here. That's set. So if I go back down to the requirements component, what we're going to notice is I have a ref or a reference defined on that component. So that ref, what that's doing is it's giving me a reference to or a pointer back to this requirements component as it's rendered inside of the view card modal. And so what I'm doing is I'm saying this dot requirements inside of the view card modal or on the view card modal react instance is equal to this requirements component as it's rendered by react. So a ref in React is saying when React goes to render all of this stuff, it's going to look for refs on each of the elements. It doesn't matter what element it is. It's always going to look for this ref. And if it sees it, it's going to call the function that you pass it, returning the rendered copy or the rendered instance of whatever element it's been assigned to. So in this case, we're getting back the instance of the requirements component as it exists in memory or in the virtual DOM inside of React. So we're getting back that requirements instance and then we're reassigning it back to this.requirements. So almost like a component level variable inside of view card modal, we're assigning this.requirements back to that rendered instance. And this is awesome because that gives us access to this component and a way to kind of talk to it and see internally what it's up to. Uh, from another component or from the parent component that's rendering it. So if we go back up to, oh boy, where'd it go? Handle edit requirements, there it is. So if we go back up to this component, the reason I explain that first is you'll notice that when we call to make our change in the database, so edit requirements here is pointing to a GraphQL mutation that I've loaded onto this component. So I've got the edit requirements mutation here being loaded. And that's giving me a function that allows me to call to the database and make my changes via that mutation. So if we jump back up to that code, there, we go, there it is. So what I'm doing is I'm passing a set of variables. So when we say a set of variables with GraphQL, I'm saying these are arguments, or this is the data that I want to pass to the database. And the two items we want to pay attention to are the card ID. So we're trying to say this is the card that we're trying to change the requirements for and then requirements. And so you'll notice that I'm saying this.requirements.state.requirements. And again, this is just nerdery, kind of just me being a geek. <laughs> there's, no, there's no real reason to do this. I could have very easily passed um, the requirements that I got from state. And I actually, now that I'm, I'm kind of explaining this to you, I might refactor it just for the sake of clarity. Uh, but this is a cool trick to know how to do. So, Remember, down below, we assign this.requirements to the instance of the requirements component as it's rendered inside of view card modal. All right, so that's one. 
Now two is because we have access to that instance, we can, and again, because view card modal is the parent of the requirements component in this case, we can reach into that component or reach into that requirements component instance and look at things like its state. So we can figure out what is the current state of that component, or more importantly, what, are the, what is the current value of requirements on state of the requirements component? And we can do that completely remotely from within view card modal, doing nothing more than using a ref. Again, kind of a geeky party trick sort of thing, um, but it's good to know that you can do it. And this is super helpful, not just for grabbing things off of state of a child component and things like that, but you can also use it to call other functions on a child component. So this is, this is like warlord level React development right here. Yeah. <laughs> so um, again, not really necessary because back here, um, I've got this dot props dot on edit and I could just as easily just say like this dot state requirements. And those are gonna pop out inside of this function here. So that value would have been passed up here. If I can type it as requirements and I could have just relayed that here like that, and I'm probably gonna do that refactor. Um, but we got to see a nice little kind of trick here that you can use for other stuff. So quite literally now, what we're doing is we're saying, let me make sure I back this up so I don't break it. There we go. So what we're saying is go ahead and send that list of requirements as it exists on the state of the requirements component, along with the card ID up to the server to store this in the database. And so what we're gonna do is look briefly at that. I don't wanna to dig too much into it. So what we're gonna do is jump to the, close all that jazz. We're gonna go into the API directory here. And again, command is being built with pup. So this is the exact same structure in pup. So if you're starting to familiarize yourself with that, I'm not really changing much at all inside of it. So this is just like the API directory that's in the stock version of pup. So, Inside of the API directory, what I'm looking for is, I believe it's under cards, mutations, and nope, I lied to you. It is not on card mutations. Is it requirements? Kind of like a goose chase. There we go, yeah, edit requirements. So um, I, got, I got weird organizational uh, things that I do. Um, deal with it. So. Edit requirements, here this is the mutation. So in GraphQL, mutation is literally just a change to some data or a mutation is kind of the name implies we're mutating data, meaning we're updating it, we're adding it, we're deleting it, but we're mutating it in some way. So this mutation function, and again I say function because it's literally just a function, is working on the different requirements in our database. Now the actual code inside of this isn't terribly important in terms of what this thing is doing. Uh, and the reason why is that ultimately at the end of the day, all it's doing is checking to see, has a requirement been deleted? And if it hasn't, just go ahead and upsert these requirements back onto the database. So again, that's not terribly important in the context of this tutorial. Our job is to worry about drag and drop, but I did wanna show you this just so you can understand what is the flow of the data here from the client. So basically, to black box this one on you, all I'm gonna say is what we're doing is we're storing the requirements back in the database. That's it. So once we've done that, now we're gonna go back down to view card modal. And you'll notice that I'm doing this little doodle right here. So this is refetch queries. So refetch queries are a convention of Apollo. And now you're probably like, what in the hell is this dude talking about? Talking about GraphQL, mutations, and Apollo, and I quit. Don't quit. Uh, refetch queries, Apollo, GraphQL, profit. Somewhere in here. They're actually, eventually that is the goal, right? We're trying to make profit. So refetch queries is a convention of Apollo, and Apollo is a library used on the client of an application to communicate with a GraphQL server. So the concept of GraphQL is that GraphQL is a server that kind of sits in between your UI and your data sources. And so literally it's not really a thing that sits in between the two, but 
uh, in terms of like a logical flow of how this is working, you've got your UI, so like your React components and all that stuff, and then those via Apollo can talk to your GraphQL server, and your GraphQL server is talking to your database. So if we go back up to our requirements mutation here, when I say GraphQL is talking to my data sources, I literally mean that GraphQL is responsible for calling this function, edit requirements, but then internally it's talking to, in a sense, uh, the database or data source that I'm using. So in this case, MongoDB is what I'm using here, but it's talking to MongoDB on my behalf. And then MongoDB is gonna say, what's up, dude? And it's gonna reply to that mutation, and then the mutation or GraphQL is gonna take that reply back down to the client. And so it's gonna handle that whole process for me. So Apollo is allowing me to talk to GraphQL to trigger that entire process. And so here, refetch queries is a feature in Apollo that's allowing me to say, after I've performed a mutation, go back to the server and refetch this data. And so what this is doing is it's updating the cache in Apollo. So not only does Apollo allow us to talk to our GraphQL server, but what it also is doing is it's allowing us to store or keep a cache of the data that we get in response from the GraphQL server. And so when we say do a refetch query, we're saying go back to the server, get the current state of the data, and then put it back in the cache or update the cache. And so we do refetch queries in our UI to say, make a change to the data on the database and the server, but then refetch the data so that our data on the client is up to date. And so basically what this is doing is making our data real time. So when I do that, what just happened is we had our on change handler fire, we update the state of our requirements component. Once that's complete, then we're going and we're triggering that on edit prop. That on edit prop is then calling our mutation. That mutation goes up to the GraphQL server and then inside of the mutation, we change our database. That mutation completes, it responds back to the client and then when we get to the client, we see that we have that refetch query. So we run that query, which is going back and fetching this entire card's contents again. So it's getting the card again. And then once it gets the card again, it's going to take that response. And as part of that card, we have the requirements in the query. And I'll show you that in a second. So we take that list of requirements and we put those back onto the Apollo cache. So quite literally, the cache is updating. And so... Keep in mind, so we're going to move this to the top of this, this list here. So if I do that, and I go away from this card, so I'm going to click on Wally here, and this one doesn't have any requirements, so this is kind of neat, so we can see that the, the UI is dumping out. So I'm going to say, uh, totally different list, Wally is an awesome movie. Okay, so we're, we're fudging with a totally different list of requirements here, but Keep in mind, I haven't refreshed the browser, I haven't done anything like that, but if I come back over here, we still have this in the correct order. And the reason why, now keep in mind, when I close that modal, that state is being blown away, that modal is being dumped, so it's completely reloading a new card when I click on a different card. But that data still exists in Apollo's cache, so back over here, if I click back, when I click on that card, what I'm seeing, and let's go and look at this, so the view card modal, when that loads up or when it's opened, I'm taking the ID of the card as a prop on the view card modal component. So I'm taking that card ID, so the one that we just clicked on back here in the UI, I'm taking that ID, and what I'm saying is pass that to the card query. And if we look, look at the GraphQL query for the card, that's this whole turkey here. So we'll notice that as a part of that, it's giving us back the requirements for that card. And so this is the long way of saying, and this is important if you want to understand this stuff, uh, what's going on when we run our mutation. So am I in the right spot? I am. So when we run our mutation, let's edit card extras, edit card, we got a lot of edit card stuff edit requirements, there we go. So when we run that edit requirements or afterwards, 
we're going to refetch the card query, which is this entire card query. So that card query is being called both when we switch between cards as well as when we make changes to a card. And so the reason I just showed you that is because when I do that, we just went and refetched that card. So we updated the Apollo cache. And so if I close that and go to another one, this is a totally different card's data. But if I go back now, because we have that cache in Apollo, our data stays intact and we can see it. And so this is just a long way of saying that what we're able to do through this process is keep our UI updated in what looks to the user as being real-time edits or real-time changes without having this really jarring experience. We're not refreshing the browser, we're not doing anything like that, um, but we're still persisting data, which is neat. So we're making changes in real-time as a user, and behind the scenes, our code is actually changing the database and syncing the database with the client. We don't see this as a user, but it's nice to know as programmers, like, that's how that's working. So we're syncing everything all at once, and the user is just like, I'm just having fun. I'm having fun managing a, a list. This is great. Look at that hot dog. We can put that on the top of the list. And they, they, they have no clue. But you feel like Superman, so that's awesome. <laughs> okay, that was building a drag and drop list along with understanding the ordering. And I know that was a lot, um, but this is war, kid. So uh, that's, that's how this stuff goes. But hopefully you learned something here. Um, and that is going to do it for this Feature Friday because it's kind of late. I shoot these at night and I need to go to bed. So um, before I let you go, I do want to remind you, make sure to hit the subscribe button on our channel as well as click on the bell. So if you want to get notifications as soon as these are published, please hit that bell so you get them up in your little notifications doodle. Uh, but that is going to do it for me. So signing off for the HMS Beagle. See you next time, folks. You just listened to me run my mouth for the better part of an hour about a bunch of really technical code. So why not commemorate that experience by watching another tutorial and having an absolute psychological meltdown? <laughs>